I ended off the first half of this video lecture by asking these two questions, because you really need to understand the answers to these if the rest of what I'll say about projectiles is going to make any sense. So the first one was about the acceleration components. And the acceleration is the freefall acceleration. So it is g down, which in the chosen axes that I've defined here is negative g times j hat. And so that means that our y component of the acceleration is negative g, and the x component is zero. And of course, I could choose to orient my y axis down, in which case my y acceleration would be plus g, and that's often a more convenient choice. The second question is almost a trick, but it's a trick that students often fall for. If we define impact as our final time, what's the final velocity of the projectile? Well, the answer is that we don't know. In general, we would have to solve for it, but you might have been inclined to say that it's zero. If you said it's zero, then you've missed a key point here. When we talk about the projectile, we mean this object from the time it is launched until the time it hits the ground. And that is because during that time the only force acting on it is gravity. But once it hits the ground, it accelerates because of forces on it due to the ground. And so it's not a projectile during or after that impact. Its final velocity is certainly zero after the impact, but that's involving a process that has nothing to do with the projectile motion. So we mean the velocity of the projectile just in the instant before it hits the ground. So now we know our acceleration components, and they tell us that the x component of the velocity must be constant, right? Because the x component of the acceleration is zero, and the y component of acceleration will have no effect on the x component of velocity. Similarly, it tells us that our y component of velocity changes at a constant rate, because a y is a constant. And the only other thing I'll say before going on to talk about equations is that this works for a projectile, but it works more generally for any object which is accelerating at a uniform rate in one direction. So for example, a hovercraft has no need to be facing in the direction it's going. And so if it's turned somewhat sideways and the propellers are producing a constant thrust, then that hovercraft will accelerate with a roughly constant acceleration in the direction it's pointing. The resulting trajectory would be just like a projectile trajectory. The difference would be that the acceleration wouldn't be g in general, and we could solve the motion by defining axes so that the acceleration points along one of our axes, it doesn't have to be the y-axis, and proceed as if it was a projectile. So, because the acceleration is constant, we get to use our old familiar uniformly accelerated motion equations, except that we're now in two dimensions, and so we have to use their full vectorial forms. Well, the first two UAM equations are vector equations. Here they are written as vector equations, and so the first one will separate out into two component equations like so. And in the first one, we note that for a projectile, ax is zero, and so that turns it into a rather trivial equation that isn't even particularly useful. In the second equation, that acceleration is plus or minus g, and I'm saying plus or minus because it depends on which way you've oriented your y-axis. And similarly, the second equation separates out into two component equations, and once again the acceleration part drops out of the x component of the equation, and in the y component we know that acceleration is either plus or minus g. The third UAM equation, though, is not a vector equation. Look at it. It appears to involve multiplication of vector components by other vector components. And so there's something going on here with vectors multiplied by vectors. Now, we know how to add and subtract vectors, and we know how to multiply a vector by a scalar. But we don't yet know how to multiply two vectors together. We'll actually see that in the next video lecture. And so for now, all I'll say is that 
even though this isn't a vector equation, we still wind up getting two independent equations anyway. The first one again is trivial and totally useless, but the second one we can use. Actually working projectile problems is fairly straightforward. It's just uniformly accelerated motion after all, but it is also rather detailed and time consuming. So I'm not going to work any problems on it in this video lecture. I will post a supplementary video lecture where I'll work one or two for you. The real reason I'm not doing a projectile problem is that I think it would be far more worth your while for me to work a problem using the equation of motion split into components. We've already been practicing writing out the equation of motion split into components, but now we know more about how to calculate those components. So I will work a problem which demonstrates that. So here is an example. We have a hiker using a rope to pull their pack up a slope. And the rope is making an angle of 15 degrees relative to the slope, and the slope is 20 degrees above the horizontal. And right now the hiker is pulling with a force of 160 newtons, and the pack is accelerating up the slope at 1.2 meters per second squared. And I've, draw, I've drawn a free body diagram for the pack. There's the gravitational force, a perpendicular force, and a kinetic friction due to the slope, and the force that the rope is exerting on the pack. And what we want to do here is find the strength of the friction force exerted by the slope on the pack. The first thing I should do is define some axes. And a piece of advice I've given before is that you should always define your axes so that one axis points in the direction of your acceleration if you know the direction of the acceleration. And in this case, that's up the slope. And so I am going to point my x-axis up the slope and my y-axis perpendicular to the slope. Now the next thing I'm going to do before working any further is I'm going to simplify my notation somewhat. These symbols for forces with all the subscripts on them are really good when you're figuring out what forces exist and checking whether you've correctly identified them. But in a case like this where we only have a single object, and so there's a single gravitational force, and in this case a single perpendicular force, and a single friction, and so on, the, the notation is unnecessarily cumbersome. If I had multiple objects, I would probably keep this notation, but I don't. So I'm going to simplify it before I go any further. I only have one gravitational force. I only have one perpendicular force. I only have one kinetic friction. This, well, I could just call it FC for contact force, but that's awfully non-specific. So because it's because of a tension in a rope, I'm going to call it T. Now it's time to write my equation of motion. And so I'm going to write it as a sum of x components and a sum of y components of my forces. And let me start with the x components. So remember, I've defined my x-axis up the slope. And so I have some x component of t. I have fk is pointing straight down the slope, and so I just have minus the magnitude of fk. And then fg has some x component, where I've written plus, although we know this is negative. So there's a negative hiding inside this. And that will all equal max but ax is just a because the acceleration points straight in my x direction. And so now similarly, my y sum, I'm going to have a ty. I'm going to have an f perpendicular. And I'm going to have a y component of the gravitational force where I've written plus because this is a component. We actually know that component has a negative buried inside it. And my acceleration is straight in the x direction. And so this is 0. Now it's time to use our new knowledge of how to decompose vectors. So first I'm going to write down that the magnitude of that gravitational force is the inertia of the pack times g. And this magnitude of t is, we know, 160 newtons. And so I am going to decompose them. And so I'm going to start by drawing the two triangles. 
So I've drawn the two triangles here, and I've put the axes here just to remind us which way they are, and in particular that shows us that both the x and y components of the gravitational force are going to be negative, and it's all just trig now. So for example, I can see that the x component of the gravitational force is the opposite to that 20 degrees. Now, first of all, I know it's negative, so I'm going to put that in right away. And then it's the opposite side to the 20 degrees, and so it's going to be mpg sine 20 degrees. And similarly, now that we know that the one is the sine, if you know your trig, you'll realize the other one has to be cos. And now similarly, with, the, with this tension force in the rope here, I can see that my Tx is this time the adjacent to that 15 degree angle, and so it's going to be T cos 15 degrees. And similarly, my Y component is T sine 15 degrees. I've just pulled my equations of motion down here where you can see them, and I'll now rewrite them using the components that I've found. So I have my Tx minus my magnitude of Fk, and so on. And note, I'll just circle my unknowns. That's it. And this is the one I want, and I can see that I can solve for it directly out of this equation with no further work, and so I'll just do that. And so I've plugged in the numbers and used my calculator, and I come up with an answer.